Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Lindsay. Welcome to e-commerce marketing with the Pitbulls, where we try to cut through the noise and simplify digital marketing for authentic brands looking to make more sales online. Today, we're joined by Brady DeLong. He is the VP of Sales at Clean Age. Um, so welcome, Brady. Andy, Lindsay, nice to, nice to talk to you guys today. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, looking forward to kind of diving into how Clean Age utilizes e-commerce and different platforms and whatnot. Definitely, yeah. Can we, um, actually, before we get started, where whereabouts are you located? I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. So um, awesome. most people don't associate Cincinnati with uh, CPG products, but that's like kind of a pretty big CPG town. We've got Kroger here. Uh, we've got P&G here and it's starting to shift. We've got a lot more startup brands kind of starting to come out of Cincinnati. So we've started to have some like meetups and stuff like that here. So it's it's turned into a pretty cool little CPG scene. That's cool. And is Clean Age uh, headquartered there too? Or are you remote? Yeah, so a little bit of both. Um, so myself and the founder were based here in Cincinnati, and then uh, we kind of have like a secondary headquarters with a venture studio who helped launch the brand, who's based out of Portland. Um, awesome. So we're, we're trying to turn Cincinnati into more of like a HQ and get a warehouse here and build staff here. Our 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 second hire was actually she's she's actually a Cincinnati native as well. She lives here, so yeah, we're we're trying to do a little Cincinnati thing. Get back to work in in person. I like awesome. remote, but we do a few days in person and a couple of days remote. Awesome. I love the, uh, the mention of the venture studio there. I'd love to uh, dig into that a little bit in a second here. Um, but yeah, before we uh, really dive in, can you just give us a, a high level overview of the brand and kind of what your role is there? And uh, yeah, how's, how's the brand gotten started and, and where's it going today? Yeah, so we can actually start with the Venture Studio. Um, so Clean Age um, was kind of born out of the Venture Studio and our founder, Rachel Peters, who was a partner there, um, was this was kind of her idea. She was at the Venture Studio at the time and created this concept of a brand that was essential care, personal care items for teens. Um, so it was originally, like right now it's deodorant. We've got like toothpaste tabs, but definitely the... the scope of the brand, the goal is to kind of encompass the whole bathroom and be the whole personal care journey for teens as they kind of start to take care of themselves. We like to say on the journey from personal care to self-care. Um, so it's a really interesting time and we've all been there uh, when we were like growing up and, you know, you kind of get stuck with dad's old spice or mom's secret or right guard or something. And like, it, you know, maybe that works for you and that's you know fine if it does uh, in today's society there's definitely a lot more focus on natural products especially for children uh you know as adults we're like yeah i make the choice for me um but when they're younger bodies you know we are we tend to do organic baby food and you know try to you start kind of down that path pretty early on um and then as they kind of transition into their teenage years and start taking care of themselves, like there really was nothing. Um, there was no brand that was like, we're here for you. This is a difficult times, but it's not the end of the world. This is all very normal. <laughs> so like, don't freak out. Here's some deodorant. Here's some personal, other personal care items. Um, so that was kind of where the, board, the, the brand was born from to kind of fill in this gap. Um, and there's a huge need in the marketplace. Uh, it's like 40 uh, average of about 40 million teenagers at any given time in the United States. And to think that there is not a brand nationally sold in retail that targets such a large customer base is wild. Like, like you don't <laughs> think about it until somebody tells you to think about it. And then you're just like, wait, that how, how is that not a thing? Uh, that is really interesting. Yeah, exactly. Like you mentioned, I had that exact experience just listening to you talk there. Like, it's not just a, you know, deodorant brand that happens to be for teenagers. It is like a very specific time around, you know, self-care and, and learning about things like deodorant. So yeah, very uh, interesting. And I mean, at the end of the day, the deodorant is just a natural deodorant. Um, you know, I use it now. Uh, I made the switch from using the antiperspirant and doing the aluminum thing. I made the transition over. Um, it takes a while to kind of your body to adjust to natural deodorant. Most people kind of panic early on. They're like, I'm sweating more. It's like, yeah, it's because you've been shoving aluminum into your pores for like, for me, two, two plus decades, 25 years. Um, 
So it's like, it takes some time for your body to clear that out. Uh, and once it does, it's actually been interesting, like how I've noticed changes, but, um, so yeah, it's, it's a cool product. We're, we're really happy with it and it's cool packaging too. Um, so we are doing these paper tubes. Um, a lot of the paper tubes you see are push. Um, we didn't really like the push. Ours are twist up. So they do have a little bit of plastic, but on average, we're about 80% less, less plastic than traditional tube. Um, and our plastic is recyclable. So the whole thing can go in the recycling bin when, when you're done with it. Uh, so sustainability is, is big at our core as well. Uh, we also have like toothpaste tabs that actually come in like this milk carton style box here, which is really fun. Um, so yeah, that's that's the brand. I love the packaging. And I have to say, as someone who grew up as a teen in late 90s, early 2000s time frame, you had like everything was super clinical and really harsh. That was targeted for teens. I'm thinking like proactive, those like chemical smelling zip pads that you would use that were just like the worst <laughs> smell ever. And everything was just like really like action packed branding that was like really intense and in your face. And I have to say, I really love this more gentle approach with teen that it I, and I'm curious, like how they're experiencing this branding from you, because I just remember being like terrified of that stuff and it smelled so chemically and it was so harsh. And this like softer approach just seems like so much nicer to walk them through this stage of life. in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's, yeah. I mean, that, that's a big part of it is just like, we, so like you say, the packaging is like softer and, and it is, and that's partly because, you know, when we're on the shelf in store, we don't, just want to stand out the teens you know if you're buying natural deodorant want to stand out to you um but with a lot of like our marketing and like pdps that you'll start to see online and stuff are definitely going to be a little more like what we're calling maximalist so mm -hmm. which is a reflection of modern teenagers like mm -hmm. they have so much going on it's insane like the, <laughs> our founder, her daughter is 14 or maybe she just turned 15, I think. And like, you know, we get a lot of inspiration from her and her friends and like paying attention to what they're doing. And it's like modern teenagers are just as busy as adults. They're going from one class to a gym class, to a sports thing, to another lecture series to the, I mean, it's pretty much like they're college athletes in high school now and so it's just like or whether it's band or whatever their extracurricular is like every kid has so many extracurriculars they're so busy so like this maximalist vibe is something that we're going to kind of start to play around with in some of our messaging because we have multiple customers you know we've got the kids the teenagers who not only do we want to buy it but we want to tell their parents they want them to buy it and then we have their parents. Um, and then we have the, you know, people that just want to buy it because it's natural deodorant. Um, mm -hmm. So we've kind of got to touch on all three, which has been fun slash challenging, but challenging usually is fun. So. Yeah. I okay. wanted to ask a little bit more about targeting your marketing to this younger generation. I think Andy and I had a conversation not that long ago about the differences between millennial marketing and Gen Z. And just like, have you found that to be particularly difficult, especially since you have multiple generational targets, I guess I would say. Um, what have you found as you're kind of exploring that? Well, we definitely recognize that like, we're still testing. Uh, mm -hmm. like we have not figured it out yet. So, you know, to give you we figured out some of it. So just to give you a little context, we launched in retail about 14 or 15 months ago um, in one retailer, Fred Meyer in the Pacific Northwest, about 130 stores. Um, until January of this year, that was really our only efforts. Um, and we are a retail first brand. So we've always done some direct to consumer, which I'm sure we'll get into um, e-commerce a little bit. But like, so the brand has not really been in market that long. So we're still very much learning exactly how we're going to communicate to each one. You know, obviously like millennials like things super clean. Like they don't like a lot going on on the packaging. They don't necessarily love images on packaging as much. Um, they like, I mean, you look at some of our competition and it's just like a white tube with one name on it. And it's like <laughs> so basic. Um, and that's very millennial centric. Um, but 
our attributes and our values are kind of cross-generational. So I think that is where we're really able to communicate to multiple different generations at the same time. It's just like our values and what's important to us and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so, you know, our packaging is just one expression um, and one touch point. It's not like the end all be all for us, um, which some brands it's able to be. And I mean, that's great. Uh, but for us, we definitely kind of have to hit hit a few different. Um, so yeah, I mean, the Gen Z market, they don't like to be sold to. So a lot of UGC content. So we are going really heavy on on that. And the influencer and ambassador side of things is, is a huge portion of what we're doing. Probably, you know, people probably haven't seen too much of that yet. We actually just ramped like a week ago on that. We finally finished like our pilot program and started seeding product to, to folks. So you should start to see more of that if you're in our funnel. Um, and so that's huge there. And then on the millennial side and maybe their parents, if that's maybe top millennial, lower Gen X, um, it's a lot of retail centric advertising. So it's, you know, whether we're doing coupons with social nature or, or we're doing stuff with like sample, which is like a digital couponing redemption flow um, or on shelf discounts, you know, Kroger yellow tags and Walmart promotions and, and whatnot. Um, so that's, that's what tends to work well because those people are in store and they're the ones doing the shopping. So um yeah, there's definitely different tactics for each different generation. Tell me a little bit more about, I love the the idea that, you know, started from a founder who had a teenage daughter, it clearly kind of the, you know, the passion of the brand comes through, you know, I guess the idea for the brand kind of came through this very personal story. Um, but yeah, tell me about like starting with that uh, accelerator or, or, or studio, as you mentioned, um, and kind of what that experience was like taking just an initial idea through to, you know, production and becoming, you know, a true brand as we would experience it. Yeah. So I came on with the brand, like after that phase had kind of wrapped. So, I mean, I can share what I know about it and everything and, and the, the journey, uh, but I was not a part of that initial process, but yeah, I mean, it was pretty much the studio launched created a handful of different brands to kind of test. So they were doing everything from like how expensive were keywords? What's it look like on Amazon? What's the, what's, what do Google ads look like? Um, what's customer acquisition costs for this category typically? And they were doing that across a, a bunch of different product lines and different categories and, and product sets. Um, Clean Age won. And then they also just like surveyed the market. Like what, where is there a gap? And so they did some consumer research uh, this brand got a lot of very positive feedback in the early days of, of the of those kind of tests. A um, lot of positive indicators that there was a need for it and that it was feasible. So then they started exploring for a contract manufacturer, which you know ninety nine percent of the brands in this category are contract manufacturers. There's very few people that are manufacturing their own product in these categories. Um, so it was finding that. Through that contract manufacturer, they, you know, told them what they were looking to accomplish. They helped source the packaging, find the innovation there, develop that product in tandem with the co-manufacturer, um, and launch that. And this co-manufacturer we still work with. You know, they were great because we were able to run some some smaller runs to kind of get things going. Um, so then it was capturing some initial content and getting you know getting the website built and all those things and then there was a, a early pr push just to kind of see how people responded to pr um and all all signs pointed to uh, again like this was this was a good idea so then started pitching retailers which was i think the big step was they got in front of a couple of different retailers presented the product as is um each retailer kind of had some suggestions. They loved the idea. They saw the gap in the market. And so uh, one of them ended up biting and being like, I want to bring this in. And that was, like I said, about 14, 15 months ago. And so ever since then, 
it's been kind of bonkers um, <laughs> and growing really fast, which is which has been great. Um, so now, you know, a, in the beginning of this year, we were in about 130 locations. As of right now, we're in about 2,500 locations. Wow. And by Q3, we'll be in about 4,200 locations. Uh, so quick ramp, quick acceleration, uh, but it kind of, kind of shows you the potential of this subset, this category, and, and you know the values that are important to clean age. Yeah, I love that kind of starting with a lot of the research. Of, hey, you've got an idea in place, but you know, really working with somebody who understands how you can suss out, you know, is there an actual spot in the market or you know, how should this be positioned in the market? And I think that's one of those things that, you know, we work with a lot of passion brands that, you know, that's it's great. You've got a product that you really care about and you've got a a mission behind everything. But at the end of the day, you've got to figure out the economics of it. And each one of those little steps, you know, the research, getting the website set up, figuring out how to pitch retail is like this insurmountable hurdle for a lot of people getting started up. So I like that idea of kind of, at least at a, a starting point, let's just have somebody helps guide through all the, all the initial steps like that. Yeah, totally. And that's, you know, that's what draw me, drew me, to the brand, you know, as we kind of started talking about me coming on board here, it was the fact that all of that homework had been done was like, okay, um, this is a startup. So there's always some risk, obviously. <laughs> um, but I was also the first hire. Uh, and I, I was brought on because I had about a decade of retail experience and distribution experience and working across multiple different distributors and retail outlets and independents. Um, so, which was the skill set that they didn't have. They had the, the brand and how to build a brand and do all of that and advertising. And um, so that's when they brought me on. And and so I, I came on board full time, like the end of November of 2022. So just, awesome. just crossed like the six month mark here. Cool. So I'd like to pivot a little bit too. I know we talked about being very retail focused, um, but when I come and I check out your website, you've got a, a you know beautifully designed site, a lot of great content up there. So I'm curious, you know, even where that's not the main driver of your sales, um, you know, how do you think about the role that e-commerce plays in you know, say a retail a retail first uh, brand? Yeah, I mean, so we always especially like with our product. So because we are, you know, we do have a mission, you know, we're not a necessarily a mission driven brand, but we do want to, we want to help a specific set of people through a specific time. So being available to as many people as possible is important to us. Whether or not we put efforts behind those channels is one thing, but availability we, we definitely want to have. We don't want you to have to go buy a $2 stick of chemicals because you don't have one of our retailers close by. That's that's unjust and we, you know, we don't want that. Um, so that's why even like on our website, like we do offer single sticks, which a lot of our competition doesn't do single sticks. You have to buy like a three pack. Now on Amazon, we do have a three pack just because the economics of Amazon just doesn't really make sense. <laughs> um, so yeah, so for us, it is availability set, like very just centered around. We want to make sure whoever comes across our brand has the opportunity to experience the brand and integrate it into their self-care and personal care journey. Um, and I think the other big thing is like, there's, say you're buying snack foods. There's a lot of brand hopping in other categories. Uh, therefore, custom, so in, in our category, it's like if you find a deodorant or a personal care product that you like, like that's what you buy for a long time. Like it takes a lot of effort to get you to switch off and go to a new brand. So like if we put in all the work and all the effort to get you to switch to clean age and you enjoy the product and then, you know, maybe you move or you, a new grocery store pops up closer to your house and that one we're not in yet um, and we don't have the ubiquity of some of our competition, like we don't want to lose that customer 
because they have to now drive 20 minutes to go get their stick of deodorant. Like I can't imagine there's too many people that make special trips for <laughs> deodorants, like maybe like your shampoo and stuff like that. I, I get, um, but so it, it's really about like customer retention and like just always being available to our, you know, existing and, and new customers. So that that's that. like the primary driver for us right now. It doesn't mean that it won't become more important to us in the future. Um, but that's kind of where we sit right now. How, how does it interact with retail? Is it kind of seen as, you know, from the retailer's point of view, is it seen as kind of positive that like, hey, you've got more visibility, you're doing more marketing work on your own on behalf of this product that you're going to sell in our stores? Or is it like a form of competition? I, for the most part, I think it's seen as a positive. Um, I think it really depends on your approach with your retailers and your relationship with your retailers. You know, when we are pitching retailers, Clean Age is, expresses from the very beginning, like we are a retail first brand. Um, so if we say that, and then we're not participating in some of their offerings, their marketing programs, their consumer outreach, op, like, you know, their coupons, but then they go on Amazon and they see a price point that's maybe better, or they see that we're offering a coupon or, you know, they're seeing sponsored posts. Then I could, th I, th I think that it can be detrimental. Um, so we just have to make sure, and we are making sure that we put our money where our mouth is. And that if we say we're a retail first brand, we're not going to outspend you or out advertise you to, to steal traffic away from you. Like retail is first these offerings are secondary, whether or not, you know, we're investing $10 a day in this one and, and the retailer will invest $9 a day in, in Amazon. <laughs> so, you know, whether or not we are, or are not investing in, in first or second, it's like, it's, it's just that it's, that's our primary focus is retail. Um, so it's not that e-commerce or Amazon isn't something that we're investing in. Yeah. That's really interesting to kind of think through the uh, some of the facts, especially when you mentioned pricing. I'd imagine that would would come up quite a bit as far as making sure that you know you're you're protecting retailers' price points. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that is one that like they would reach out about. Like, they'll be like, "What's going on here?" <laughs> uh, well, and they have all have their own marketplaces now. I mean, you talk about Target and Walmart, um, so. If you're not on their marketplace, but you are on Amazon and maybe you're in you're in a Target and you're in Walmart, like that can hurt your relationship with those retailers if you're choosing to not be on their marketplaces and your pricing is not competitive with your Amazon listings. So that is there's a there's a huge push from both of those retailers right now. I mean, it used to kind of be secondary, like when you'd kind of get the paperwork from one of those suppliers, they'd be like, oh yeah, and here's our here's our offering for our marketplace. You know, we'd love for you guys to participate. And now it's like, no, this is required. Like you have to participate. You're on the platform. Um, these are our requirements for images and listing quality and, and et cetera, because it is like the primary place of discovery for for so many products these days. As you start to push more nationwide, do you find is it um I'm curious if the e-commerce side gives you any bit of a leg up in, you know, already having some national presence in, you know, maybe a region you're pushing into or vice versa. Is it that, hey, you know, scaling beyond, you know, into different regions is allowing you to do different things or is it kind of completely two different, you know, supply chains and workflows? Um, so right now, our plan is to definitely leverage e-commerce success to grow retail. Um, so not that, not the other way around. Um, we definitely don't plan on being like, oh, we're having a lot of retail success in this area. Is there a way for us to grow our direct to consumer business in this area? That's not an avenue that we would take, but we are would definitely, as we we see a hot spot that all of a sudden in Texas, we've got all of these different direct to consumer or Amazon shipments or whatever it might be. 
we are 100% going to take that data and utilize that data when we pitch retailers and be like, we're shipping 50 cases a week to Texas. And these could be HEB customers or central market customers. Um, so yes, we, we definitely leverage direct to consumer and e-commerce data to, you know, showcase our viability to our retail partners. As we, I know before we started, you were talking about, um, warehousing and, you know, kind of where you, where you're set up or, or position, does that come into it at all too, as you start to expand, I guess, uh, w- what does that look like for, from, you know, the shipments that you would be making direct to retailers versus e-com shipments? Are those completely separate or are those kind of running through the same warehouses? Or? A little bit of both. Um, so we have a, uh, a 3PL partner that's based in Indiana. Um, they have secondary facilities throughout the, the uh, out west that we're not utilizing right now. Um, but that is where like all of our wholesale business ships from. Um, they have the ability to do all of our pack and pick FBA prep, um, all of our direct to consumer right now, we're actually still utilizing our venture studio partner who has those capabilities. Um, for most marketplaces, we're probably going to ship, we're probably going to transition to a reseller strategy. Um, that we've found some strong partnerships with that we're probably going to go in that direction. Uh, we're trying to keep our our staff like incredibly lean on the operations side. Our brand our our brand is built, and is, our goal is to be acquired. Uh, this is not something like Clean Age. I'm not going to be running Clean Age in 2026 or 2027. Like the goal is like sell this thing in 2025, 2026. Yeah. Um, like we want to, we, we want to be acquired. Um, so keeping things super lean with that goal in mind is, is really important to us. Um, so we might eventually, you know, in the next year or so, I, we could maybe open a warehouse here in Cincinnati. We've, we've talked about that. Um, just, but I don't think we would do f- a ton of fulfillment out of here. I think we would still work with a lot of resellers on marketplaces that are professionals in those spaces um, and let kind of them manage the majority of that. But um, yeah, the world of 3PL and logistics and stuff like that, it's just, it's a lot. (laughs) And it's like (laughs) constantly evolving and changing and it can, it can be expensive to make changes. And so it's just kind of like, we tried to do as much due diligence when we picked the one we did to like pick a good one up front, keep it simple uh, and run as much as we can through them. You know, anything that makes sense economically to do that, that that's what we're kind of doing. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I feel like that's a, uh, a whole nother uh, topic, maybe a topic for another day that like fast growth to, to uh, acquisition. I, I think that's interesting. And that, you know, the, the difference between working with like a, you know, kind of lifestyle brand that, Hey, this is something that I'm passionate about and I'm going to run for the rest of my life versus, or pass down to my, in my family versus like, Oh yeah, I want to, uh, you know, let's, let's get this economically viable and and work towards acquisition. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important to, to not be ambiguous about your future. Like you can change your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, that's fine. But so many of the decisions that you make early on it's so much easier to make them if you have an exit strategy in mind and you know saying that you want to exit in five years you know you could get to year four and be like you know what this has actually turned into a pretty free cash flowing business and i've been able to keep things pretty simple i'm gonna hold on to this um whereas if you have the mindset of just like, I don't know, I don't know what we're going to do. Like, we'll take it day by day. And like, you don't really know what you're building towards. You're usually just like keeping an eye on like some KPIs or some different metrics that tend to just be lag measurements at the end of the day. So um, I think, you know, it helps a lot that we kind of have that, that vision of where we want to be, what we want revenue to be at, what we think it's going to take to get there what we need to invest. It helps with budgeting. 
Um, so yeah, it really removes a lot of the uncertainty around uh, just the future. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you've gave some great examples just from, you know, logistics to team growth and all of that. Like it's, you know, very, you, you would take a very different path depending on what your, your end outcome is. So it's important to know that. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Um, Lindsay, did you have any other uh, questions or, or points that you wanted to hit on today? No, I just think it's, that's, my head is just kind of like spinning with the thought of, we work with so many of these, I would say like at least smaller starting out passion brands who are doing exactly like what you said, they're keeping an eye on KPIs and they're not thinking, what really, what is the end goal? And I'm sure a lot of these founders are eventually wanting to pass it on to somebody, maybe get acquired or maybe even just pass it on to a family, like their children or something. And they're not thinking about that exit strategy. So I just think that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, even if you're not going to be acquired, even just like getting yourself out of that seat is probably a really important thing to be considering. And it's probably difficult at this, at this stage <laughs> when you're, you know, really swimming in it, but can you expand a little bit more on that? Even if you're not looking to be acquired, what a founder and like this, a smaller passion brand, what should they be thinking about in an exit strategy? Man, uh, I mean, I, I think, I think like the, the, the crux of that is definitely like, there's a book, I forget the exact name of the book. Um, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for it, but, and it, the, the phrase is like working on your business versus working in your business, which I'm sure everyone has, has kind of heard. And, and I think that's kind of like the first step is being like, what am I doing every day? You know, like I'm working in the business. I'm not necessarily working on the business. So I think like before you could even, I, I, I think you need to just set, figure out, like set the business aside for a minute and be like, where do you, where do I want to be in 10 years? Like, do I want to be the operator of an Amazon brand and giving all my money to like Jeff Bezos forever? Like, <laughs> or do I want to do something else? Do I want to sell? Like, and just having any guardrails, like having one guardrail is better than no guardrails. And I think people get really concerned about like painting themselves into a corner and like, putting themselves in a box when like I'd rather be in a box and be really good at that box than just be like mediocre at like everything. And I, I, I waffle on that. I, I don't know if I actually like the way that that came out because I do think you want to be kind of a jack of all trades. I do think that that's important. Um, and to know enough about things to be dangerous but but when it comes to the direction of your company like to at least like know which corner of the room you're like kind of want to be going to makes a lot more sense and i think you can find yourself eliminating a lot of redundancy um in your operations and potentially like doing the work twice um don't get me wrong i've done a lot of work twice uh <laughs> like um so you know, it's going to happen for sure, but it's, I think, it, I think it's more of like a personal thing of like, where do I kind of want to be in five or 10 years? And where does the business fit into that? Mm -hmm. uh, and you are seeing a lot more people these days, at least I am, it, like, not so obsessed with year over year growth. Like, this is my business. I do $250,000 a year. My margins are good. And this is enough for me. And life is great. And that is incredible. And like, so I think it's not necessarily like exit strategy versus not exit strategy. It's just like, what are you trying to get out of your business? And like, what do you need? Um, so I think that's kind of like the first step for, for people there. If that was a very long-winded circular <laughs> way of answering that question, but uh, yeah. No, it was great. I think it gives a really interesting perspective too, and I agree with you. I feel like I'm seeing less and less of the focus on year over year because I think a lot of, at least of the smaller business owners that we work with are seeing the damage that that does when such larger companies are 
so focused on that year over year growth and constantly beating the year before it and what that looks like, like what they're eating up in the process. Whereas now people are kind of shifting their ideas and business of like, what's enough, like what's just enough and how can we operate there and be fine with enough. <laughs> it's yeah. like a different way of thinking about it. And so it's, it's kind of, it's cool to see like the discussion around it and the brands that are kind of playing in that space. So I think that was like a wonderful answer just to give another perspective for a lot of the brand owners that are listening. Sorry, I just hit my microphone. Let me say that again. <laughs> so I think it's an interesting perspective um, for a lot of brand owners to be thinking about like, it, is that where you want to go is enough enough or are you reaching for something different? Yeah. And that's like, you, you mentioned, you and I mentioned KPIs and then you reiterated the KPI point. It's like, you know, for years, like the two most important metrics were like your, your CAC and your LTV. Like <laughs> that, that was the foundation of like all of your decision-making was like, can we, what does it cost? How much money are we going to get out of these people over the next few years? And that in turn is how much we can spend and the results and the revenue we get. And like, that was like a business model. Like that, that was all you needed. Uh, and now the trendy terms are margin and cash flow and profitability and EBITDA. Like, so mm -hmm. like the language in, in the space of all CPG, whether it's retail or whether it's e-commerce has like really changed in the last six months and it's kind of started about a year or so ago uh is when kind of i started seeing the terminology and what people were maybe really focused on um i've always worked in cash flow businesses i've never so like clean age we do have investors so we are able to be more aggressive with our growth strategy um but previous you know stops in my journey were, were all cash flow based so we had to it was, I mean, every penny in, every penny out, everything was accounted for. Everything had to have ROI. We had to have a certain margin. Um, and it's a, it's an entirely different way to run a business if, mm -hmm. if that's how you're running a business. So, um, and both are fun. <laughs> but like it's a, They're both fun ways to run a business. But yeah, I mean, to your point, uh, it's just where, where do you, where does this operator and or this founder kind of want to end up? So. That, that's such an excellent point too, because I feel like a lot of our brands that we meet are comparing themselves unknowingly to venture backed businesses when they are the cash flow type to see like, well, maybe that's where I need to be and how I should be reaching. And you don't know, <laughs> it I mean, could have all the at, backing. You <laughs> find that these like huge DTC brands. And I mean, they're blowing hundreds of millions of dollars a year, like losing hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Like it is it's insane. And, and the well is like the well is dry. Like there is no going back to the well for some of these brands. And it's going to be interesting to see where some of these like really big brands that people have been buying for five or six years kind of end up. Um, and, you know, you can, anybody listening to this can probably pick out some of the brands I'm talking about, like they'll, they'll know, but you can do some pretty quick Google searches on, on, uh, DTC brands losing money and, and see some top 10 lists that will blow your mind. Um, so it's, yeah, that's one of the biggest, uh, biggest myths that we kind of, kind of bump up against that people say, Oh man, you know, there's these big players out in the market and because they're spending all this money, they're getting much better results. Like it's tough to compete with them by, you know, spending smaller amounts of money. And the, the answer, you know, the, the truth is it's not that, Hey, they're spending, hundreds of thousands of dollars per month and getting a much higher ROAS. It's no, they're accepting a much lower ROAS, which is allowing them to spend that level of money. It's not profitable on a, you know, first purchase basis. So I think that's a, a really interesting thing that a lot of these small founders like have this picture out there that, Hey, there's these big, big dogs in the market and they're spending enough to crowd us out and they're making a ton of money doing it. When in reality, it's like, no, it's just a totally different strategy. Like, that's that's fine if that is your strategy and you have investors and you can do that, but you've got to know that that's the play and you're probably looking for a very different margin and a very different you know type of type of world if it is a cash flow business. Yeah, and you got to know if that's okay with your like if that's what your investors want you to do. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> like, and 
and it's not anymore. Like it, that is not the model anymore. Um, at least from what we're seeing, like yeah. when we have conversations, um, it's very much about our margins. It's very much about how many customers and what our velocity is and repeat customers and things along those lines. It's, it's, uh, yeah, the, the dialogue is changing and I think it's for a good thing. I think it'll hurt some people, but I think in the long term, I'm hoping it'll kind of bring down the expectations, kind of like you guys both were saying of some of these brands and be like, okay, I don't need to be all birds. Um, yeah. Like mm-hmm. that, that's not realistic. Um, well, and hopefully it should make, I mean, we're really primarily focused on Google ads and we you know, work a little on Facebook ads and it's, it's tough for the smaller brands to compete because they you know, are looking for you know, profitability on a, on a first purchase or, or you know, margin based profitability. And they're competing with some of these other, other players. So hopefully some of those trends that you mentioned will start to kind of push it so that, you know, maybe it gets more competitive for everybody in the market space that you, you know, if everybody's looking to actually make a profitable purchase, then um, you know, you don't have to drop down to a, a break even ROAS in order to compete or something like that. Yeah. And, and I, and I think, you know, a big thing there is it's going to be really hard to just be a retail or just be a direct to consumer brand in the future, because the customer acquisition costs, like retail brings you scale, like e-commerce just can't. Well, it can, it just takes a long time to get there. And it takes a lot of money to get there. Whether or not you have great margins and you've got amazing people and a lot of talent that have, you know, eked every penny out of ads and content and, you know, you've, you've built it, which happens. Um, but it's like omni channel, uh, the other new buzzword, uh, <laughs> that's existed for a while, but like that, that's very important these days is like, you, you need to be thinking about, I need this person to see me multiple places. Um, so that's, that's important even for small brands to start thinking about if they are doing just e-commerce, like, okay, let's start thinking about retail and, and how do we, how do we start to build a relationship with retailers and, um, and vice versa, if you're a retail centric brand, it's like, you have to be available online. If you're not, that that's crazy. If you're if you're an emerging brand, like so, um, so yeah, I think it's just kind of going to be the norm moving forward. Definitely, omni channel and hopefully profitability. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> makes for a lot of excitement in uh, measurement and attribution and all of that too. As we get into that, talk about another uh, another conversation for another day. But that's another whole can of worms. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing these insights with us today. I think this was um, really helpful and, and uh, you know, hopefully I, I think we uh, left a lot of meat on the bone there. So maybe this won't be uh, the, the last conversation that we have with Brady. Um, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for being here today. Can you uh, let our customers, I know we, we talked about omni-channel, so the answer should be everywhere, but uh, uh, more specifically, where can our, uh, our uh, audience find you? Yeah, so um, clean-age.com is the website. Um, we do have a store locator on there. Right now, we're national at Rite Aid. Um, all of our products are gender neutral, but at Rite Aid, they do have gender-specific sets. So, you know, make, we have three scents. We have a fresh, a waves, and a citrus. So those are broken up in in Rite Aid currently. So, you know, make sure you check both sets for each of the scents. Uh, citrus is in the women's scent and the fresh and the uh, waves are in the men's. Um, I don't know why they picked it that way, but that's, that was their decision. Um, <laughs> but, and then we're also in Fred Meyer in the Pacific Northwest, if you do live in that region. And then this summer we'll be launching in, um, I think I can say it, um, but we'll be launching a Walmart, um, not every store, but about 1800 stores across the country. So we'll be in off so exciting. in Walmarts, um, later this summer should be like kind of the end of August. Um, and then we are available on Amazon and obviously on our, on our website as well. So, um, but we'll be, you know, rolling out the new retailers every, 
every month, hopefully, if I'm doing my job right, we'll have we'll have more retailers and more distribution uh, every month. Awesome. Well, you heard it here first. Go out and get some clean age deodorant, whether you uh, have a teen or just uh, want some natural deodorant. They smell really good. I mean, they 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 really do. Like that was, and the packaging's really cool. So, yeah. You know, we're a small, fun brand, and we'd appreciate any support. And I appreciate you, know, you guys, Lindsay and, and Andy, having me on and uh, sharing our story. Definitely. Anytime. Lindsay, you want to read us out? Yep. Brady, thank you again for such a fascinating, wide-ranging conversation. I, we really enjoyed that. And if you liked what you heard today, go ahead and subscribe to get notified when we launch new episodes. And if you're ready to take the next step in your digital marketing journey, check out ppcpitbulls.com slash assessment, where you can take our digital marketing maturity assessment, and we'll help you determine your next step. And we will see you all next time.